Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Okay, so here we are. Welcome back, listeners. And I'm glad to welcome Elliot Lump. From, you might have heard of him in a previous capacity called Pira. I'm to talk about. Now we... Um, we're very much happy to welcome you, Elliot, um, to the show to report to us mostly about signals. Um, and also, uh, yeah, your journey, how you got here through your studies, your research interests, your your passion, what's drive, what's what's basically moving you around in this world, and why you now spend a lot of your time in the day on uh, working on research integrity. So Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm uh, looking forward to speaking <laughs> with you. Okay, if we could just start with giving us a short um, snapshot of, uh, well, your English, start from a geolocation. What did you study at uni? Was it also biology? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so I did, uh, I did medicinal chemistry. Oh. Um, so that's why I did my I did my PhD in medicinal chemistry. It was uh, it's kind of looking at a new drug for asthma, um, one that kind of didn't increase heart rate, um, mm. which kind of the classic you know inhaler ones do. Um, yeah, so I did this at University of Nottingham, and it was a collaboration University of Nottingham and Monash University, which is in Melbourne. Um, but, you know, at the end of the four years, I uh, I didn't really like being in the lab. It wasn't wasn't for me. So, you know, I moved into publishing. It kind mm -hmm. of seemed like a, I, I guess it's something that a lot of people make, right? You're still kind of connected to academia, um, mm -hmm. but you're more working with people instead of sort of chemicals or cells. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I started working at Frontiers. It's the, I'm sure most people know <laughs> Frontiers is and at this point. So the Open Access Publisher. So I... I was working in their research topics team, so helping people build these article collections. Um, so I managed a team there, and then you know I I moved into strategy and planning. Um, I was kind of interested in this high level strategy uh, type type roles. Um, so in that, I you know I did a variety of things, helping teams to kind of connect their processes, help teams be more efficient, look for new opportunities, and and kind of part of this was learning as much as I could, I think, about how a business works. Mm -hmm. um, because I had an intention, I guess, of starting my own startup. Mm -hmm. um, then in... Wait, so you already knew yeah. you run your own thing, but at the time, were you sure it was to have to do with publishing of some sort? Or maybe because you... Were... I think so. Well, I, I think that I kind of have this... I'm not sure it sounds like silly to say, but a kind of almost like a, a desire to kind of like make positive change somewhat, like to make something like a little better mm -hmm. in the world. And I, I think I always used to think that was that that was through academia and that's how I could do it. You know, if you do medicinal chemistry, the dream is that you're going to make this 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 great drug that cures something. Right. And so um, and when I went into frontiers, I realized that through business, you can also really create change in a, in a very positive way. So when you when you figure that you want to start your own business mm -hmm. uh, while working at a publisher, and then you said, okay, you you saw that um you want that you can also um, um change the world to the better through publishing or through industry approaches. So mm -hmm. what was it at the publisher that you saw you where you could invest yourself to also contribute something meaningful to society, as mm -hmm. you was you knew you could do as a researcher. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think because I was just publishing, right, and publishing is, is very interesting and there's lots of 
moving pieces that are constantly changing. Um, but there are also, there are lots of problems to solve, I suppose, um, within publishing. Um, and you know, ultimately what I landed on initially was peer review. Um, I think a lot of people start on peer review <laughs> when they're <laughs> entrepreneurial in, in academic publishing. Um, I think it's one place that we all see problems, but but it's really hard to change, um, as as I found, and you know, and I think a lot of people have, have found themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I think probably if I if I if I placed myself in a different industry uh, mm -hmm. straight after my PhD, I could imagine that I would have wanted to create a startup in in something else. But I think as Look, has it? Uh, it's in publishing, and I think this is very good, you know, for, for me because I, um, I really enjoy publishing, and I, I really like the people within, um, within publishing. So I, I think it's a yeah, mm. a great thing for me to be in. To be doing. Okay, cool. So then, okay, then that's a good, that is an uh, is an e easy, well, not easy, but is is a small, relatively small step to go and fix peer review so you you started peer how did, how did that happen <laughs> <laughs> when, when was that yeah. like looking back what made you decide okay i'm going for it i'm starting a company inviting you know like people to join the team and then running this show to fix peer review so i do actually remember the moment <laughs> that i realized what it would be I think mm -hmm. uh, for PRF is that so I had you know this notion that I want, would like to have a startup and I'm, I'm looking around at these problems and uh, you know I was reading loads of kind of books around this at the time and, and what I was reading at one point was this book called um, The Lean Startup uh, I mean every I think everyone that's an entrepreneur has probably probably read it um and it was talking about this one chapter which it was talking about this, this startup in america it's, i think it was it wasn't doordash anyway, it was some kind of delivery service and it spoke about how um they didn't build an app or anything to begin with they just literally like knocked on someone's door and asked them what they want from the supermarket and then <laughs> went and got it for them okay and then when they got feedback and it helped them eventually design this this product mm -hmm. and and that's kind of like a light bulb moment in some ways because i think from the people i'm speaking to it, it it really felt like i needed to be technical so I had to you know write code or i had to have a co-founder like ready to go who mm -hmm. was technical to to even begin starting a startup and, and i didn't have i didn't have a friend or you know colleague that was ready to who was could write code really well and was ready to start start it with me okay so um so this always seemed like a blocker but then i realized you know i could i could just do it myself <laughs> and i can just you know i don't need uh, a technical product i can just um handle these things you know, mm. by, by hand essentially like, like these people go to the supermarket uh and i knew what peer review process looked like and a lot of my work was to do with making processes more efficient um and we know i think we all know that the peer has lots of problems and um and so yeah it, it kind of like, well i can just do it right and from that point i then started developing mm -hmm. this idea of what it would look like why what kind of specific problems are in the process it was, it was solving and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then over the next kind of like five months that idea developed and you know at some point i decided that i would start saving money <laughs> to to support myself for a little while yeah. um well there was no you know income or investment mm. yeah i know that pain <laughs> yes i mean I, yeah, yeah the access to perspective i also didn't have any seed funds just hit the rock <laughs> running or going walking <laughs> pacing myself mm -hmm. um land acquisition partnership building the whole all the things that you learn as an entrepreneur. <laughs> but mm. I, I can relate to that light bulb moment. Like suddenly it strikes you as an entrepreneur. It's like, oh yeah, I can fix this. <laughs> and you don't know where to take the strength from where it just happens. Like, 
Um, what were the exciting things in the beginning, the early phase? Like, maybe I can share mine. Like, yeah, um, uh, yeah, go for it. What was? No, 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 just to give you a head, like, like, um, like some. I don't know. Um, I think it's like it's it's an explorative phase. You kind of know what you're doing. You know, you can solve an issue. And well, I suddenly thought, okay, I have an idea of how it should work. And then I still had to build the expertise to actually teach others. But, or in the mm -hmm. case, more of a product. But for me, then that might have been Africa Archive, where I'm, sh I'm sure it works, but how can I convince people of actually using it? Because it's, it's, it is a no brainer to adopt, but then to encourage the target audience of here, this is the thing that you need. It's not, it turns out it's not so obvious to them. <laughs> so, Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was exciting but also frustrating at the same time to me but then the learning curve and those moments of oh yeah and then when people actually realize what that product or that tool or service can do for them and seeing the appreciation i found that quite exciting mm -hmm. yeah i think some of the, the the learning kind of part they're kind of constant <laughs> difficult problems um it's quite you know exciting in its own way and I think the the kind of you get to speak to lots of people, okay? Like, you're right, you, you wouldn't in my like regular job, whatever is doing before that, you know, you wouldn't just yeah. speak to all these you know, people in in different in, in different publishers, um, um, and it kind of enables you to do that and be able to just drop someone an email in some publisher you've never engaged with and then have a conversation with with mm. someone. Um, and it sounds quite good. And, and, you know, I didn't, you know, obviously I, my first job was at Frontiers and that was quite an internal job. And then, so I didn't really have a network for our publishing. And you know, from this, from having PeerRef that enabled me to talk to, you know, lots and lots of people within. Mm. And so, yeah, and that, that bit was quite exciting. Um, and, you know, fun too, because you met, like, yeah, loads of great people now. Mm. Uh, um, but yeah, I think those two things were the most kind of, yeah, <laughs> exciting right, right at the beginning. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. So, but here it really looks like uh, an, an easy to adapt solution to a, a huge gap in the system, so to say, because um, as a re like whoever's re listening, editors and publishers would know how difficult it is to find reviewers. On the other hand, researchers tend to be approached by publishers. Oh, can you review that article for us? I'm not going to compensate you, but surely you want to because you have the expertise. Um, what not? And then more and more of such inquiries come into your mailbox. And now Pirev is here to make the whole process easier for both parties. Isn't what? Well, should we speak of it in the past array? <laughs> what is um, yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> so what we I mean we spoke spoke about this earlier um that it's probably still early in the process of changing the system towards making the necessary workflows know that we have so many research articles being published and getting coverage and finding reviewers who have the necessary expertise, the global sensitivity of, um, so to avoid all these biases that have um, become an actual issue or have always been an issue, but now being addressed by many organizations. And um, from how you and I have been working together to bring African scholars into both positions that PRF is servicing the researchers and who are then the reviewers or to be reviewers, but also editors. Uh, where am I going with this? So now, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, and then we, we said before, before the session now that it's, it's, it's so early and maybe the market is not ready for a service like PRF just yet, or would have needed some seed investments to have like a longer uh, 
time more time available to to encourage the market or how do you say that um so what what did what made you decide to eventually was it the opportunity now with with research signals where you saw okay here's something that's a quick fix it's easy to adopt it's a no-brainer and also i can have a better proof of concept kind of thing oh not proof of concept there's a whole other issue you're addressing with signals we're explaining mm -hmm. what and how in a minute but what made you make the decision to switch yeah so the idea of, of journal independent peer review wasn't kind of like a, a new you know concept um people had tried before uh so rubric tried axios had tried there are other you know products or platforms that are available now uh, like review commons and research square and when i started peer ref what i thought was different from kind of rubric and axios which were say six or seven years before um was a kind of rise in preprints right so um so we had you know these pieces of research on the internet that, that needed reviewing okay uh, and that we could we could do that um and right at the time you know this was just after it was within you know, covid uh we saw this huge increase in the amount of preprints there was this like, hockey stick um of, of the out the, you know, the amount of preprints being published um you know assumingly that was going to continue <laughs> going up and up uh until until it was you know as, as many as journal publications mm. um but it but it it stopped you know it, it did have that big growth in say 2020 2021 um but then it, it's plateaued you know uh, around there so this this kind of huge change in how people publish like it, it didn't really happen so um one of these kind of reasons for starting for thinking peer could work this time or journal independent peer review could work um kind of stopped being true in a sense but for me um i think another part you know aside from the obvious that it just wasn't gaining traction um you know is that we weren't trying to solve a specific problem uh we we're trying to solve lots of problems i guess but it was that we were trying to change an entire process right you know, where and how peer review is done and this has tons of stakeholders, right? This has funders, it has institutions, it has researchers, it has publishers, and then the publishers have different people. They have the editors, they have you know, um, other publishers. So, trying to convince all of those people to like change this process is incredibly challenging, um, and you're having to come up with a different solution essentially for each of their individual problems. So. This was, I guess, a, on the scale that I was working at, was, you know, almost impossible. I guess I, I saw it as, an, and and yeah, as I, as I mentioned previously, you know, I was doing a lot of work to, you know, get people onto the platform and then help them you know, get their reviews and find reviewers, etc. Um, and this was very challenging in its own right, uh, mm -hmm. and. It just the amount of people, you know, wanting these reviews and the amount of people wanting to do the reviews. Um, this was not getting, you know, easier yeah. over time. You know, there wasn't more people kind of lining up to 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 get these reviews. So, mm. so it just seems, you know, kind of like, well, we can just keep pushing, pushing, you know. Um, but it. it <laughs> It got to the point where it didn't it didn't seem to make sense to me to to continue and actually i could spend some time that i had to explore you know other problems you know more more specific problems that people were experiencing and try to find solutions mm. to that and so um so this is where i guess the beginning of well not necessarily the beginning of signals but the idea of the idea of signals started so um see so at the time and this is april i guess of uh, last year you know all the all the hindawi stuff is happening so all these retractions and 
um, you know, research integrity was really at the front of everyone's minds. And it's just this huge problem that that there isn't really a solution to. And so, mm. yeah, it was a it's just a a very good area to look at if you if you're trying to, you know, solve a problem for publishers. Okay, so if we can pause it for a second. So mm -hmm. from your experience with PRF, would you say that we need to uh, go back to fewer publications, back to quality away from quantity, because we've just exceeded and exhausted the community? And maybe PRF is a prime example or proof, of, proof for that observation. Because there's just so too many articles to be reviewed, and researchers tend to, if all those reviews are to be done by researchers, there's not enough time for them to do research anymore. I mean, it's not that they only have to <laughs> reviews; they also have to do all the grant writing, and there's not. But how much? There was actually, um, there's actually surveys going around and and um, reports. From these surveys, how researchers spend a huge amount of time on reviews, but also most important, uh, most of the time goes down to administrative work, including grant writing. And like, how much time is there then to actually do research? And isn't that the job that they're being paid for? And then also teaching. Well, so what's your what's your conclusion from PRF? Is there something, mm -hmm. or if you dare to to give advice to the community, like? <laughs> So I, I wouldn't say I've come to a conclusion because this I, I have a I have a current opinion, <laughs> um, and that will probably change, um, and it constantly kind of changes. So I think I think more information is better. Essentially, I, I think that we need to put as much inf as much useful information out there as possible. Sure. So with every like article, you know, there should be lots of all of the kind of data and code that's associated with it. Okay, so we, we need more and more of that kind of information. Um, and there's anyone, any time that someone does some research, you know, if that, you know, if it was a successful piece of research, if it was a failed piece of research, whatever, I think it should be accessible to someone else to see sure. it, okay? Um, so I do think there should be, <laughs> I think there should be more output of, of right. I'm research, not saying we should stop to I... publish. I'm I'm just saying we should publish meaningfully and then see the the actual research output. Like is what my <laughs> mantra nowadays is it's not the research but... article but the data set. And yes the research article is a packaging to make it look nice and, <laughs> and comprehensible. But we need to make sure to share data fairly <laughs> like kind of accessible uh, interoperable and reusable with an emphasis well on reusable for which the other um letters are the prerequisite mm -hmm. and then yeah, so... for need to fear um, publications we will cut through all the crap because then phd students wouldn't have to do all these experiments which others have already tried multiple times mm -hmm. and hundreds and thousands of times in many subjects um but it would be obvious, okay, let me just look it up. Somebody else has tried, oh yeah, look, they did, and it didn't work, surprise. And then you can decide, okay, should we try another way? Or do we take this for granted, it just doesn't work, so we can try something else. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So so I think that's kind of argument for kind of more research to be you know, out there. But when I think of, I think if we're talking like publications, we're thinking of this, mm -hmm. well, or I guess I am now thinking of like curated, you know, research. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I think there should, I'm not sure that that's where I think maybe there should be kind of less of that. Right. So, um, it's easier to find the stuff that you're, there's a high likelihood of finding important. Mm. Um, and then that's the stuff where you go through, you know, very, that's the stuff that we really rigorously peer reviewed the stuff that's, if, if an article gets used, you know, gets viewed a hundred thousand times. Yeah. That should have really rigorous peer review, whereas if there's something, you know, any, some piece of research and it's a ne negative result and it's used, it's viewed 10 times, then there's much less need for that to have the same level of, of scrutiny. Oh, okay. Well, that's now a brain twist on my 
<laughs> of the day brain because i would argue against but let's not go into that rabbit hole but, I would <laughs> get the result. but that's my probably my opinion today <laughs> oh, okay. um but, I, but that's for me saying you know because if we right. publish absolutely everything i get you yeah. then we, can, we probably can't have yeah. rigorous pre-published peer review yeah but okay. i'm just but. putting this like from when you publish something on, on the internet yes you can steer where now it's going to be discoverable and we're doing that now with persistent identifiers in the scholarly system and this is where signals comes in when we get there in like less than a minute um but then how can we say that uh like which research output is, um, is relevant to whom and how many and how many are going to click on it and actually read those study i don't know okay let's not even go there <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> because what's what's locally relevant might be a game changer because it might be replicable in other parts of the world and eventually change the world to the better, where what's considered of international re relevance, which is highly biased at the moment, so depending on who says that or makes a claim of what is and what is not globally relevant, uh, might not have any positive impact or negative uh unintendedly so so i don't know i think we can leave that for another discussion to go into the details but more importantly signals now research signals is doing a great job on leveraging integrity through metadata on published research items so mm -hmm. what now and and now we're going back to where i stopped you for a minute on two things and it was like half an hour ago no not quite as long but so what like okay the jump from PRF okay it's it's still about integrity it's still about efficiency in, in publishing so now what's at what point did you switch from focusing on the review process and facilitating that towards um measuring reliability of the research that's being published yeah, so I guess it got to this point, as I mentioned, where um, we decided that PRF probably wasn't going to work or it'd be better to spend you know, my time looking at a different problem and research integrity was this very current, very big problem that publishers were, were experiencing. But don't so, you just use the opportunity of a trend that unfolded? I mean, it's also a fair argument for building a business, but <laughs> Sorry. so <laughs> so I guess it is what we decided to to look at, right? Um, and of course, it's important, sure. right? So you know, scientific or you know the research literature is kind of like the foundation of of knowledge, mm. right? And so. It's very, very important that that's trustworthy. So, you know, if nothing else, it, it should be trustworthy. Um, and things like paper mills, putting in, you know, creating these fake articles that say, you know, this gene is associated with this form of cancer is is really bad, right? This, is, this isn't something that, that should be in the literature. And if we can do something to... Um, to stop that happening then that that's a good that's a good thing mm. so i think there's two things there there's, there's, there's the wanting to do something positive okay and have a positive impact but also doing something where you can execute it and people want it okay because that's because you can have like the best like most altruistic idea but if nobody wants it, it it's not it's not it's not going to happen right so and i mean this is what i saw with peer ref right i thought it was a, a good thing to do but but if people don't want it, then it's not, it's having no impact. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, this this problem of, of research integrity, or, well, to be honest, I think research integrity is maybe the wrong, it's the word we use, because it's, it's what the industry uses, but but it's, it's, it's maybe not the quite right word. I think research integrity is a very broad thing that mm -hmm. includes things like conflict of interest, um, you know, articles having ethics statements, and that's not really what we're looking at. We're looking at research fraud, mm. so or publication fraud. So where people are knowingly creating, you know, fake articles and 
manipulating the publishing process to get that published. Um, that, that's what we're trying to help publishers stop. Um, mm. and so yeah, so we spent, yep. But where we see now with paper mills, I mean, Freud has always been there to probably lesser extent because the pressure was not as high to publish, to build your career as a researcher. So I don't know, it's not a blame game here in the show, but okay, but I'm saying, okay. So there's paper mills, there's, um, there's discussions around predatory journals, which I I could give you plenty of examples that most of these are actually mislabeled because they mm -hmm. again biases. I don't know if the same is true for paper mills. I haven't gone into that as much. I mean, I understand the concept of yeah, just getting published for the sake of it, but uh, so I mean it's also a way. Like I don't know, can the paper mills that you've seen i mean are there it's not actual physical mills that stand somewhere it's people who are you know, computers help people others get published or no the the whole concept of paper mills is fake articles right it's basically um fabrication of, of data is that it yeah exactly so these are there are businesses that just create you know something that looks like a research article that contains something that looks like research. And then they send this to a journal um, and maybe they add peer reviewers to the process somehow. And, and then they get it published. Well, before they get just before they get it published, they sell the authorship, okay? Oh, okay. So they will send around, you, you know, you can, people sometimes every now and then put these emails on Twitter. Um, you can see them where they say, you know, we have, uh, we have two articles ready for publication in a mm -hmm. um, in an Elsevier journal, and it's got an impact factor of four. Um, do you want to? We've got like first place and second place authorship for mm -hmm. sale, um, and yeah, and, and people, you know, buy their spots, and then it gets published. But there's nothing. Yeah, the, these articles have no truth in them. Right? There's no research in them. They're just it's just made up. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So yeah, that, that's what we're trying to help publishers to identify. A, how big of a problem is it really? I mean, it's growing, but if you would put numbers to it, is it more than one percent of the published of the detectable digitally detectable research that you can find? So or... it's hard to know how much of it is um, because we haven't found it all yet. Um, so if you ask, for example. So Adam Day, he is the kind of is the founder of, of another um startup in this space called Clear Skies. Mm. Um and he's done you know some analysis on basically all the literature in the last, I'm not sure how long, but um let's say the last decade. Mm -hmm. Um and so he's he's you know, he looks at say, these are the articles we know that are paper mills. Um mm. and then he looks for articles that share, you know how similar it is those articles. So also have like a high likelihood of, of being a paper mill. Mm. And what he's found as a lower bound is it's probably 3% of, of, of the literature, right? So, so something like 70 to 150,000 articles published last year um, were complete, like just fake. And, and that's the lower bound. So this is, it's a, you know, 3% of articles is, is quite a lot. Um, and, and yeah, it's kind of, unacceptably <laughs> an unacceptable yeah, amount I, I would say yeah, that's crazy like even the close to one percent is also too much i mean that's, mm -hmm. that's crazy um okay so now signals comes to help mm -hmm. us detect that as researchers so we, that we don't rely on literature that's actually fake but also editors to warn okay is this a mission by mm -hmm. um, author who doesn't either doesn't exist or this article which presents data that doesn't exist. I mean, that mm -hmm. is fabricated. Um, and then you, so you can detect um, self-citations, retractions, and then screening community comments for their um, approval or uh, contrary statements. Yeah, so we're mainly focused currently, we're focused on these kind of like negative signals. So. So usually things that are, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Mm -hmm. 
So we, we've looked at, say, the set of known paper mill articles. Um, and, you know, we kind of had a hypothesis driven approach to this. Like, we think we'll see mm. this thing happen, right? We'll, we'll see the, we'll see something in the metadata. And through that, we were either right or wrong, or we just saw trends that we didn't expect to see. Mm. So, uh, and one, I think one really kind of nice example of this is we were, we wanted to look at self citations, right? So, self citations are really useful because they allow us to see um, previous output by the authors in a way that doesn't get into the kind of author disambiguation problem. Mm. So, and what I mean by that, if that you know is unclear, is if if you want to look up an author uh, and you go on, say, Google Scholar or Scopus, um, we haven't really solved the problem of of you know getting it just their research and all of their research so it may be a merged together of different you know multiple john smiths um or it might not be their entire work so so this can be unreliable but this is what um, but by look, in, right where orchid but orchid, but orchid doesn't do this too well i mean orchid has mm -hmm. currently because you can make there are multiple orchids for mm -hmm. you know the same person yeah. um and it depends if you know, that journal pushes the uh, publication to that, that person's ORCID account, whatever. So, it, say there's 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 multiple, yeah, people. So the it's not it's not solved the problem. It could, I think, if if everyone if everyone tomorrow decided that I'm going to make one single ORCID account, but mm -hmm. unfortunately that that hasn't that hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not to say ORCID isn't useful it, it very much is for, for lots of other reasons for, for this purpose. but the the author disambiguation problem it, it doesn't solve um so if we look at a reference list and john smith references john smith it's highly likely that that is the same person okay mm -hmm. so um so we look at the reference list we take you know what are the self citations and then we get lots of information out of that okay so we can see um what they've previously published, what areas they were in, you know, we can see is it similar to this article. Um, we can see where people have collaborated before. We can see what journals they've published in. We can see if they have any retractions. Okay, so wait, um, so the citation is not bad on its own because, I mean, of course, at a certain degree, it becomes a uh, misconduct because you shouldn't only sell, cite yourself. But exactly. So we'll self citations like are normal. Yeah. Um, it's it's completely like most research is building on top of your previous research, right? <laughs> so, so we expect to see self citations. Um, we would we put a you know we put a red flag on something if it has more than say um, thirty five percent. Mm. Yeah, so it would get a yellow flag on signals if it was more than twenty five percent, or a red flag if it was more than thirty five. Um, you know, the future of the publishers using this platform, they can adjust that. To, to whatever they see fit but but yeah so some amount of them is normal and a good thing if they had 90 percent self citations that's obviously probably <laughs> a problem um and it's probably trying to you know artificially inflate their citation count mm -hmm. um but uh but what we saw in loads of these paper mill articles so like 70 80 percent of them is they had no self citations, mm -hmm. and this is really strange, right? You don't get this in in like a a legitimate yeah. journal because unless you're a PhD student, you're just starting off, and your supervisor allows you to, well to be first author. Oh, right. Yeah, but so this is but this is this no self citations of any author on the paper. Okay, well, right. so it makes sense. I mean, it happens all the time that that one out of five say authors. Has no self citations in a paper. Isn't that's it, that's not question. abnormal. Just uh, so, how about humanities and social sciences? Are these people publishing on their own most of the time? But that's not the bulk of the research output. So this isn't. We could look. We don't. We haven't spent a lot of time looking mm -hmm. at that area. I, I don't think the paper mill. Hmm, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think the problem is as as prevalent in that. Um, but we would have to we would have to test that we've because we've been very focused on, um, you know the kind of STM 
I guess, yeah, at the beginning. That makes sense. It's also where most of the research proliferation is. Mm -hmm. Well, I take that yeah. Yeah, and so we saw this signal, right, of 80% of these paper articles have no cell citations. And, <laughs> and this makes perfect sense because they're not writing the article, right? A paper mill writes the article and then it gets public, well, it's going to get published and then they buy the authorship. And so there's no reason why they would have been referenced. Mm. Um, and so this signal, this alone is not indicative that something is, you know, a fraudulent piece of research. But when you start adding that with the other signals that we have, it starts to make quite a clear picture that you have, you know, a fake mill article or let's say if you look at a journal an average legitimate journal it's going to have like 10 20 percent of articles with no self citations but when you have 80 percent of those journals sharing that so 80 percent of those articles having that then it's quite clear that there's some kind of problem um so amongst other you know things that we found in paper mills uh we we've turned those into signals and then we can put an article whether it's published or, or a submission uh, through signals and we can yeah t take a look at what they are mm -hmm. cool well that's really cool and then the other one i, I like best actually well I, I see that there's a lot of value in that but my favorite is a retraction detection because mm -hmm. that's really painful well one thing is that some publishers take forever to enforce a retraction after being notified and that might be that that usually has Many reasons were no individuals to be blamed, but just a matter of, yeah, organizational uh, sad workflows, too much work to do, kind of overwhelm, whatnot. But in some, like there's a few cases that much of what you used to find on Twitter where uh, an editorial board is being notified of a retracted article or uh, asked to, an article to be retracted, and then it takes them like up to 10 years, sometimes even one or two years, even six months can be harmful to society, like as we've seen with the pandemic. Um, but now once an article is retracted, it doesn't mean that the issue is solved because the thing is still out there and is already, is already has already been cited, who knows mm -hmm. how many times and is still being taken or granted and probably so but then how does how, so yeah but i think like to then go to the signals website and then see oh it's actually been retracted and this can probably be also plugged in to publishers pages right and also reprint archive mm -hmm. whatever other systems to flag the retraction yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's it's really easy to see you know, what attracted, and, <clears throat> and what I think is even kind of cooler than that is a is a feature that we added kind of in the last couple of weeks. Well, let's say last couple of weeks when we only launched kind of three weeks ago, um, but since then uh, we added a new signal which allows you to see when there are retractions in the reference list. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, so you could have one article that that references three retracted articles. Okay, and so. Um, so it's very important then that you don't <laughs> kind of reference that part of the article that references the retracted articles. Wow. Um, and oh, again, okay. is, is it oh, okay? But well, then that's actually solving the whole chain of errors that occur by having a retraction out there. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well done. And so, well, this is also a really good way of so, so sometimes these are like honest retractions, right? So it's just where, um, they weren't aware that there was the mistake and that is some of the, the retractions um what is happening more and more now is we're seeing retractions of these paper mill articles and so there's you know there's there's tons of paper mill articles that haven't been retracted the, the majority of them have not been retracted um and they're typically quite hard to find because as i mentioned before they, they look real mm -hmm. um they're very hard to distinguish from a real article mm -hmm. um unless unless you're, you know, a real expert in the area. So the, an expert's going to know, but to the average kind of editor or, or someone in a adjacent field of research, it's, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, so, but what can happen is with those paper mills, they don't just sell articles, they sell citations. Okay, so every time a paper mill article is published, it references other paper mill articles to increase their citation count. 
Mm. So every time a paper mill article is retracted, we can then identify other paper mill articles because we can see that they reference, you know, multiple retracted paper mill articles. <laughs> so every time it's retracted, it can point us towards even more, which they can then retract to find even more. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is this is so the following retractions are like a good thing in this sense. But yeah, but at the same time, we're helping people not honestly reference them or not even, you know, not spend their time on those articles. Um, so, you know, time for the you know, researchers is limited. Um, and, you know, they, they don't want to be spending time reading and digesting something that's just made up. Mm, wow. OK, oh, that's so exciting. That's, that's really cool. That's so useful. How's it being received? We've met at the APE conference in Berlin, where you also, I mean, I, I saw um, how the audience at the conference received it very positively, um, signals as a service after your pitch, after your short presentation. Um, and how's your response as you, yeah, as you reach out to publishers, to researchers to adopt the, the service? To use the tool. Yeah, so super, like very <laughs> positive, kind of overwhelmingly almost. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so AP, we presented uh, this alongside several other startups, and then there was like a vote, and as was voted, you know, the best idea and uh, who, you know, the audience would most like to collaborate with. So this is this is hugely positive. Um, er, we have, you know, speaking to a lot of publishers now. Um, I mean, publishers are the first people we're trying to to provide this to. Um, it, of course, makes sense that kind of institutions and researchers and, and funders may also it, it would be useful to them too. But uh, publishers, where we're starting, so, and we're getting yeah very positive response. We're just getting people started on on trials of it. You know, we're very focused on uh, created a journal dashboard where. Um, they, a publisher can can access their journals. They can look at their previous output, see uh, kind of risk levels of those, um, so we can help them identify, you know, what is maybe a fraudulent article that they need to um, investigate and, and then maybe retract. Um, so yeah, so so far, like very very positive. I said uh, very different from my experience with Pira. <laughs> I, I always felt, you know, like I was really pushing Pira. Yeah. Um, whereas it feels almost like signals almost like pulling me <laughs> um, along with it. It's um, so yeah. Well, you know, it's early days. So it's wait and see. But uh, but yeah, very very po very positive so far. But it's interesting because I was going to say well, maybe obviously because um, maybe it is more threatening as a problem and more in people's necks. Um, <laughs> the whole paper mills and fake article submission kind of thing. But you would think that peer review, but I think, I don't know, maybe you shouldn't, or I shouldn't try to make sense of why peer review was harder to to take to the market compared to signals. But both are- but It's like I mentioned yeah. earlier, right? It's, it's this, signals is addressing a very specific problem, mm -hmm. which is a very big problem and, and current problem. So publishers need, to not put, <laughs> it's a problem if they publish fraudulent research. Okay, the 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 impact this has had on Hindawi is enormous, right? And, and to Wiley, mm -hmm. um, every other publisher knows that they can't have that happen, but they don't have a means to stop it happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, research every teams are small; they they don't necessarily have the tools available to them to 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 identify these articles, and so that's what we're providing. Um, whereas with peer review, it was a you know, let's change the entire process. It wasn't it wasn't a fix to a specific problem. It was a trying to change the way peer review is done. Um, so also, that, that's I mean, yeah, a little different. Wasn't it for an for an editorial team? Wouldn't it take a lot of the burden of their table by outsourcing the management of the peer review? Yeah, I mean, this is this is something we thought. Um, you know. I think peer review, letting go of control, not having ownership yeah. anymore of that database of researchers that are knowledgeable about the content. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we found that ultimately, I mean, my, my assumption at the beginning was that editors would want, would be most interested in curating 
research. Okay, so so if they had peer review reports and they had the manuscript, they could then, you know, say this is what we think is the most interesting and for our community. Uh, but actually, it turns out that that owning the peer review process, even though it's very difficult and very time consuming, is very important to editors. Yeah. Um, and they didn't want to outsource it. So again, it, it didn't solve a problem for them. Yeah, I get it. Okay, it makes sense. Because it's also content driven and and that's the exciting part of doing the work. It's, yeah, okay. Whereas the uh, detection mechanism is more technical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we do, we're supporting them. We're helping them do their job yeah. now oh. rather than taking their job away. Right. <laughs> So your clients would be publishers mostly, publishers, editorial teams, journals. Also research. Yeah, at this stage. Yeah, so a researcher could today use it, right? We have researchers signed up. Um, a researcher can search an article um, and check, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's legitimacy. Um, like I said, it, it could help them to uh, not... I have to go and read and or reference an article that is potentially um, fraudulent or have you know all the problems with it. So we'd recommend um, I as a trainer could recommend to researchers as you do your literature search, you find articles that sound and look interesting. Um, do your double um, due diligence check if it's <laughs> a fake article by using signal. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah, absolutely for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, but then to search a single article, yeah. So for publishers, obviously, because that's a bulk of the work, and they would then pay be paying clients. That's how. Yeah, so they can now access. You know, they would they would have access to like the dashboard where they can see the previous works, um, and then get say alerts whenever something changed. So, um, you know, the metadata is evolving uh, with kind of citations and retractions and, and engagement. So. If something changed in their previous publications, they would, you know, they could find out before anyone else finds out. So they can, you know, take control of that situation. Um, but we could also provide this, you know, this check at the point of submission. Um, and so, you know, when a submission was given to a journal, uh, whichever editor looks at that first could see, you know, the the signals. That the article has, and in some cases, you know, they might reject at that point because it's clearly you know a paid mill article and shouldn't shouldn't even go to peer review. Um, so yeah, so that would be a, another service that, that the publishers would have. Sure. Um, and you could also imagine this for institutions, right? So an institution could could understand um, mm -hmm. the legitimacy of of their output as well and make sure that the work they're doing is all sound because that's something that they want to. What have happened? Right. Oh, okay. Now that makes sense because I also saw like if on the on the about us about page for signals says what the section for self citations rejections and institutions and journals. What you just said like institutions can be made up and journals can be made up. So there's also something that you check for. <laughs> but um, journals and institutions can also be clients um, and using your service to ensure that they're, well, the submitting authors, respectively the um, the staff member are <laughs> publishing in literature journals or, yeah. Yeah, publishing literature journals or making sure that you know, staff are, you know, publishing kind of ethically, let's say. Um, but that they're not being mentioned as a presumably fake journal. Um, is that something that could be fixed if a uh, paper mill says oh this research comes from that institution where it actually doesn't can the institution then use signals to kind of verify that what research is actually being done at their venue Does that make sense i think if i understand your question correctly i think so so a um i mean yeah a risk actually is that a re that a paper mill um, puts on an author from, you know, Harvard University, and they, they just make up, they, do, they, they just pick a researcher and they add their name onto it. And then um, suddenly that article says it's from this researcher at Harvard. 
uh, and they would have no idea of that, right? And this researcher would probably have no idea of that. Mm. Uh, and there's nothing, so in some cases, there's no mechanism for that not to happen. Mm. Um, and a lot of publishers, they only communicate with the corresponding author. Okay, mm. so they, they never need those other authors to prove that that um, that they're on the article. So by providing, I mean, this is just one use case, but by providing an institution with the signals dashboard, they could see when they've like a, a high risk article is published mm -hmm. under their institution. Um, and they could quit very quickly, you know, kind of contact the publisher and say, that isn't, that author is not on this article. Mm -hmm. um, and that would lead to two good things. One, that the, the kind of institution isn't wrongly on fake articles. And also the publisher could very quickly identify that that was a, a fake article yeah. and could retract it quickly. Nice. Oh, so glad signals exist. Thanks for bringing it to the world. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As a trainer and consultant, I'll make sure people hear of this and use it to the, extent, to, to the, yeah, to, to the necessary extent and beyond. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that with us. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to good to chat about it. And obviously, all the best for the journey with Signets now. And I think, yeah, it's, I think like Pierre, from what I've seen, has set a great example. And it's either for others to pick up, pick it up and dust it off maybe a year or two from now. Or maybe you find the, the, what is it? The, the encouragement again to, to try again in a more comfortable time. <laughs> more, <laughs> yes, more... Uh, let's wait and see. <laughs> but I think you get your hands full for now. Signals. And that's <laughs> so all the best and speak to you soon again. Yeah, thanks. See you soon. Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.